clear distinction from, say, Audible, where they're going to set the point price and it's going to be based on length. Absolutely. So they can set their price in 16 currencies. Um, so books that are priced two ninety nine and up receive 45% um, and subscription sales are 32%. So yeah, that is a massive distinction to try and let authors kind of um, you know, have more reign over their audiobooks. Right. Um, and in addition to that as well, um, we have um, the capability of setting pre-orders. So you can set a pre-order for your audiobook as far ahead as you like. Um, and, you know, the authors, are gonna, uh, the customers can download it or like pre-order it um, and then it can be released whenever, sure. whenever you choose. So even at books that may be available at multiple markets, uh, that audiobook, there's a strong chance may be less expensive when they're shopping through the Kobo stores, right? Yeah, I mean, it depends. The audiobook pricing landscape is really, um, there's not really any rules at the moment. Right. Um, traditional publishers are still pricing quite high. So I think it's a really good opportunity for indies to sort of, in you know, test it out, um, experiment with different pricing. Um, you know, you can price your book for free. Um, free first in series works really well for us for ebooks. So, you know, can that be replicated with audiobooks like we mm -hmm. think it can? Um, so, yeah, it's a good opportunity for kind of experimentation and testing. Sure. Uh, are you noticed you've talked about the market and the sales and, and trends and whatnot? Are you discerning any trends right now? You talked about box sets and free first books. What's what's working really well for authors right now uh, in terms of ebooks or audio? Uh, either way, let's start with ebooks. Ebooks. Um, I mean, series is also is always right. king. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a really good way to kind of hook a reader in. Um, yeah, I talked a little bit about free first in series. I'm trying to think of different trends. Um, what we're seeing in terms of promotions that are working really well are kind of cross author promotions. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that we've been running um, kind of like a buy one, get one free or, or buy one, save a little bit um, with multiple authors. So um, it's a good way for, um, you know, um, authors tend to know who writes in their genres. So sure. uh, we've had people come to us be like, I write in this specific genre and here are 10 authors, you know, can we do a sale um, with these books? Um, and it's been working quite well. And the way it works is that each book gets a little bit discounted. So not one author is taking the hit on anything. Um, and it's a really good way to, uh, to kind of increase marketing because you have 10 authors now marketing this rather than just one. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're trying to do what we can to kind of push behind this. Mm -hmm. Which genres are selling best? Are you noticing any trends? Um, I mean, romance is always king mm -hmm. on Kobo. Um, yeah. yeah, we're noticing an influx this year in um, romantic comedies. Um, I kind of think it's because um, the world can be a little bit sad sometimes. <laughs> and I think that people really need a, a light break. So. so that would be a romance novel but with a heavier incidence on the uh, emphasis on the laughs? or Yeah, yeah. That's just some trend that we're seeing. Um, we also see a lot of um, thrillers are really, really popular. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it, it changes per geo. That's what's kind of really interesting about the worldwide view of Kobo is that certain books are more popular in certain areas. So, for example, in Australia, they tend to lean more towards like a historical romance or like a Western romance. Um hmm. Uh, Rue romance that actually means rural and not kangaroo. I learned that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the tip. <laughs> I did not um, know. Yeah, but um, yeah, and then we're seeing an increase as well in like sci-fi fantasy and things like that. Sure. Um, in terms of audiobooks, you know, nonfiction is is ahead right now, but I feel like that's just because that's where the market is in terms of like availability. Um, there's a real gap for romance audiobooks. Like, um, and I think once that starts to get filled, we'll see a change in what's selling. Um, and sci-fi, fantasy, um, that sort of stuff does well in audio. And I asked our merchandiser about why she thought why, actually. Um, and she thinks it's because a lot of them are very long, so you get your money's worth. Um, but she also thought that it was because you have somebody pronouncing these names to you. So when you're reading them, like nobody really knew how to say Hermione. Um, but if you have an audiobook, you do know how to say Hermione or oh, that makes sense. Or Dothraki or whatever. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That makes perfect sense. I've never like, you know, I get a series in science fiction or thrillers, what I tend to write. You got a series here, he recurs, but in a romance, I mean, how do you do a romance series? At the end of the book, they've fallen in love. It's, it's over, isn't it? What, oh, how do you absolutely. can, no? Absolutely not. No, there's 101 ways that you can continue a romance series, mm -hmm. you know, different characters, you know, some people are in the same world. Um, 
it could be the same theme within different things, you know? So Mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's no shortage of ideas in terms of any story really. Same idea, different characters, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. You mentioned briefly nonfiction. If you read, you know, the traditional press and talking about uh, New York based publishers, uh, their word is that nonfiction is outselling fiction, but that certainly does not seem to be what's happening, what I'm seeing anyway, in in the, the self-pub or independently published world. No, and I think that they're saying that, um, I mean, in terms of traditionally this year in North America, nonfiction did... Um, I think mostly based on the political books that we're seeing. So we had probably, what, eight to ten huge politics releases this year. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, those are going to sell more. So I think that's what they're saying in terms of that. I think it's all um, kind of not seasonal, but it's it's because of what's happening right now. Um, So that sort of nonfiction isn't maybe something that we're going to see into next year. I think it's completely just the state of the world that we're in. Mm -hmm. Whereas you know, romance and thrillers are, they're timeless. They're not going to be outdated as some of these nonfiction books will be. I suspect that some of the people listening to this podcast are thinking, okay, I've already got all these books that I've uploaded to KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing with uh, Amazon, but this Kobo thing sounds good. Can I do both? Can I take the titles I've got at KDP and add them at Kobo? Yeah, absolutely. Um, We will never ask. Exclusive. No, I mean, I'm always hesitant to say we'll never ask for exclusivity, um, but it really is against our ethos. Um, Even with audiobooks and ebooks, honestly, we want authors to publish in as many places as possible. So Mm -hmm. we recommend kind of coming direct with us, you know, coming direct to Amazon, using aggregators that are out there for the other areas. Um, Basically, we're just trying to think about the reader and you want to be able to give your book to the reader however they want to read it. So whether that's on their Kindle or their Kobo, you know, you should be able to give them both. Sounds like a good plan to me. It sounds like a great program. Anything we haven't talked about that you wanted to throw out there? I don't think so. That's probably it for now. If anyone has any questions, they can email writinglife at kobo.com. And if anyone is new to going wide and, you know, doesn't really know where to start, send us an email. We're always able to help. Um, we have a blog that's kobowritinglife.com. And then we also have a weekly podcast, um, the Kobo Writing Life podcast, um, that kind of features like interviews and tips for self-publishing. So it can be daunting. Um, but just, I guess my advice would just be reach out to us because, you know, We want to help you succeed wide as well. Great. Tara, thanks for being on the podcast. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thank you again, Tara, for being on the podcast. If you're listening to this podcast and enjoying it, you might want to consider subscribing to my free e-newsletter, the Red Sneaker Writers Newsletter, which will come to your inbox free of charge every two weeks. The newsletter basically gives me an opportunity to take a deeper dive, a more to provide more detailed information or articles about various aspects of the writing life. Of course, you may be noticing a pattern here as you're listening to this free podcast or receiving that free newsletter. And the linking thread in all of these is that they're all offered free of charge. How can I manage to do that? You know there are costs associated with email distribution and a lot of costs associated with podcasts. The reason I can afford to do this is because of my Patreon program. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N, which is a way that people can basically crowdfund or crowdsource programs they approve of. If you'd like to uh, be part of the mentoring program to get some feedback on your work or just like to contribute a little something to the continuation of this podcast or the newsletter, that's the best way to do it. So go to patreon.com forward slash Wilburn, W-I-L-L-B-E-R-N, first four letters, of both names and see if you'd like to make a contribution until next time keep writing and remember you cannot fail if you refuse to quit (laughs) 